Welcome back. We are ready to move on to hypothesis testing of a population mean, but in the case where sigma is unknown to us, and this will be our case then that we'll switch over to t test because the distribution will rely on the t distribution when we don't know sigma. All right, so let me first just jump into a problem here and then we'll talk about the rest of it. So it says, Heather is a demographer studying a city that has undergone recent changes. She claims that the mean household size in the city is now greater than 3.2 people. So she takes a random sample of 16 households in the city. And for these households, the sample mean came out to be 3.5 with a sample standard deviation of 0 0.6. All right, so obviously putting it in bold here to really emphasize this was just the standard deviation for that sample. So that's gonna be our lowercase s, sample standard deviation. Assume the population of household sizes in the city is approximately normal. That part is required because 16 is a small sample size. I'm just going to point that out up here. So the parent population needs to be normal, or if our sample size is reasonably large, that would be okay as well. But we only have 16 households, so they have to tell us our parent population is normal. Okay, perform a hypothesis test to see if there is evidence at a 10% significance level to support the claim that the mean household size in the city is now greater than 3.2 people. All right, so as always, we focus on writing our claim first. It's about a mean, and you're interested in whether it, the evidence will suggest that the mean is greater than 3.2. All right, so let's take care of this first. So H naught, H1, colon, colon, and then we'll write our claim. That the population mean for all households in this city is now greater than 3.2. All right, so that's our right tail test. Greater than is always right tail. And then our null hypothesis is our equal. So nothing's changing from before. Um, it's always the same process. It's just going to be looking at the given information to see the difference here. So first I'll write my mu naught. So we'll assume that the null there, 3.2 is true. And then we're gonna go out and we'll put on the picture. We're gonna go out and get some data to see if it convinces us of our claim. So they go out and get data from N16 households. And for those 16 households, the sample mean came out to be 3.5 people. And the sample standard deviation, so that's S, not sigma, is 0 0.6. The significance level they told us to use is 10% or 0 0.10. So to find our test value, we can do that by hand by substituting. We had done that once when we did our Z score test values, or you can just run a T test and that will find it for you as well. So we can run a T test. And the reason we're doing a T test is because sigma is unknown. Population standard deviation unknown. So let's go ahead and do that. So stat tests, the T is under the Z. And they gave us the statistics. So we put in our mu naught, my X bar 3.5, my S 0.6, sample size is 16. And the direction of the test, we're doing greater, so we want mu greater. Oh, I'm so sorry. Again. There we go. So we want to pick greater than that mu naught value. And then I'm going to do calculate. And 
that T is the test value. It's a little unusual that that's exactly two, that whole number. We don't even have to round it, but that's what we got here. So just write TV. My test value now is a T value. And in this case, it's exactly two. Okay. All right, so again, we'll have a choice of traditional method or p-value method. So let's talk about traditional method first. So if it's a right tail test, then the area to the right of the critical value is going to equal alpha, in this case, 0 0.10. So a right tail test is called a one tail test. A left tail test is also called a one tail test. So in this case, when we find the critical value, which is a T value, we're gonna to need to know the degrees of freedom of the T distribution that applies. And degrees of freedom, remember, was N minus one. So n was 16, so 16 minus 1 is 15 degrees of freedom. And for a right tail test, then our critical value is going to be somewhere on the right. So I'm going to show you how to find that critical value using your t table first. So our t table, previously we did confidence intervals. And now when we do hypothesis testing, we're interested in whether all of our alpha is in one tail or the alpha is split into two tails. So this is a one tail test. All of our alpha will be on the right. So one tail and that value for alpha was 0 0.10. So there's our column. Alpha is 0 0.10 in one tail. Degrees of freedom is 15. So that value is our critical T value. All right. So I'm just going to point out, though, your table doesn't know if your one tail test is a right tail test, which would mean that critical value is positive. But if it had been a left tail test, the critical value would be a negative T value. So the table can't tell you that part you need to know if this number is a positive one, that would be a right tail test, and that would be negative the value if it had been a left tail test. Now, if you have an inverse T distribution on your calculator, you could do it the exact same way that we handle Z-scores. So for a right tail test, you could inverse T one minus alpha, and it's one minus alpha because with inverse T, we don't inverse T the area right, we inverse T the area left. So if you had the calculator that has an inverse T, one minus alpha would be 0 0.90. So you could inverse T the 0 0.90 and then comma degrees of freedom. And that will actually give you the test value that should match the table there. So let me go ahead and do that because my calculator does have an inverse T. So if I inverse T 0.9 comma 15, that is 1.341, which does match the table. So you have an option, some of you have an option of using inverse T if it's available to you or just the your table. All right, so let's finish then the traditional method. So we're going to graph the critical value. So now it's a T distribution. Zero is still the mean in the center. So 1.341, just approximating there, is my critical value. So we use that to establish this area to the right. That's our alpha. And the z score, I'm sorry, t, 
the T values in that shaded region represent your critical region. Or again, it's called the rejection region. The values in the unshaded portion are the non-critical region. So once you get used to hypothesis testing, it's really all the same concept. It's just that we've switched from a Z to a T because sigma was unknown. So our next step is in the traditional method to graph our test value and see where it's located. So in this case, it came out to be two. So our test value is right there, T equals two. And that tells me that my X bar, 3.5 is there, hitting the shaded critical region. So my test value falls in the critical region. And when our test value is in the critical region, so in this case, far to the right and coming down to the decision, anytime your test value is in the critical region, you reject H naught. Okay, then let's take a look at the p-value method. So for the p-value method, we have our mean. And then the only other thing that we need to graph is our test value. All right, so exactly two in that case. So that one is our test value, so t equals two. And that told me that my x bar of 3.5 was there. And it's a right tail test. So our p value is that area to the right of it. And then I'm gonna do a visual check here about the size of my p-value compared to my alpha. So my p-value area, which up here would be that part right there, that is definitely smaller than my alpha. So I'm gonna do my visual check. My p-value is smaller than my alpha. Technically we say less than or equal to, but it is definitely smaller. So what you really wanna be careful of right here is when I say my p-value is smaller than my alpha, this less than here, this isn't indicating left or right on a number line. So you notice the area is over here. So sometimes students see less there and they're thinking something should be on this side of the graph. But we're not looking at location when we talk about p-values in alpha, we're looking at how big the area is. So all we're saying here is the p-value area is smaller than the alpha area. And we'll confirm that with our calculator. So I'm gonna go back to my t-test and we already entered all those values. So calculate, I'm gonna write down what my p-value is. So 0 0.03197, so that will be 0 0.0320, so 0. 0320. And I could keep that in decimal. Um, in decimal, alpha was 0 0.10. So 0 0.03 is less than, technically we say, less than or equal to 0 0.10. I just like to think percents instead. So p value is 3.2%, and that is indeed less than 10%. And we just technically say less than or equal to. So that p value area was 3.2% of the picture, whereas this alpha area was 10%. All right, and then the rhyme is when your p value is low, you let the null go. So everything worked out. We knew our decision from our traditional method. So Anytime your test value is in your critical region, test value out here, far from that center, in this case to the right, that guarantees that your p-value area is going to be smaller than your alpha area. And both of those always lead to the decision to reject H naught. And then as always, when you reject the null, 
the null hypothesis, you are supporting H1, which is our plane. So our summary is, we are supporting our claim. There is enough evidence to support the claim that the mean household size in the city is greater than 3.2 people. All right. So 3.5 was far enough above 3.2 to make me think that this is not really the mean. The mean for the city is actually 